A reading from the book of Moses, the book of Numbers. And the people wanting water came together against Moses and Aaron. Why have you brought out the church of the Lord into the wilderness, that both we and our cattle should die? Why have you made us come up out of Egypt and have brought us into this wretched place which cannot be sowed, nor bring forth figs, nor vines, nor pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron, leaving the multitude, went into the tabernacle of the covenant and fell flat upon the ground and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord God, hear the cry of this people and open to them thy treasure, a fountain of living water, that being satisfied they may cease to murmur, And the glory of the Lord appeared over them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod and assemble the people together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak to the rock before them. And it shall yield waters. And when thou hast brought forth water out of the rock, all the multitude and their cattle shall drink. Moses therefore took the rod, which was before the Lord, as he had commanded him. And having gathered together the multitude before the rock, he said to them, Hear ye rebellious and incredulous. Can we bring you forth water out of this rock? And when Moses had lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with the rod, there came forth water in great abundance, so that the people and their cattle drank. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me to sanctify me before the children of Israel, you shall not bring these people into the land which I will give them. Peace be to you and welcome to our mission coming out of Egypt. I hope you receive many graces and blessings for coming this evening. It's good to see you here. Yesterday, we were confronted with a rather shocking reality. In the end, in the end, we will all, each of us here tonight, will be possessed. We will be possessed either by the devil in hell or by God in heaven. And both of these possessions are for all eternity. To die in Egypt is to welcome total, eternal possession by the devil in hell. He is the master and head of all who live there. But to come out of Egypt by way of the Red Sea of Baptism is to enter the church and rely on her to make it to the promised land of heaven. To enter the church is to welcome the possessing, indwelling of God's Holy Ghost, who is the very soul and life of the church, the body of Christ. The head of the church is Christ, and He becomes our Lord and Master. The soul is the Holy Ghost, and He possesses us. Heaven starts with this indwelling. Now tonight... Tonight, we need to unpack, as it were, what it means to be possessed by either side and how that possession is initiated and accomplished in this life. There's a sort of duel, a frightful battle going on between heaven and hell that runs down the ages. It's a duel because there's only one heaven and there's only one hell. with the earth being in between. Yes, the battleground is here on earth. Or to be more precise, the battle is fought inside individual souls in this life to determine who will possess that soul forever. This battle is between two churches or two assemblies. On the right There is God's holy church, which is the holy Roman Catholic church, the mystical body of Christ. And on the left, 
is Satan's church. His assembly, which the Bible sometimes calls the synagogue of Satan. The Catholic Church, according to the Roman Catechism, consists principally of two parts. The one called the church triumphant, the other the church militant. The church triumphant is that most glorious and happy assemblage of blessed spirits, of those who have triumphed over the world, the flesh, and the iniquity of Satan, in other words, Egypt and all that it contains, and are now exempt and safe from all the troubles of this life and enjoy everlasting bliss. That's the church triumphant. Well, the church militant is the society of all the faithful still dwelling on the earth. It's called militant. Because it wages eternal war with those implacable enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the Roman Catechism. Now we know there's also the church suffering, which is the church in purgatory. And coming out of Egypt, the promised land, that promised land symbolizes... The church triumphant. And all the distance between the Red Sea and the promised land represents the church militant and the church suffering. So it's a type. Now this is contrasted to a similar but opposite reality in Satan's assembly. Instead of fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil in this life, they embrace them. I'm going to live it up. Be prodigal. Some more than others. Thus, it is the church of surrender and conciliation. That's the devil's church. Surrender and conciliation. Not militant. Since its members have not triumphed over these things, but rather embraced them, once again, some more than others, they are doomed upon death to descend immediately immediately into the depths of the earth and join Satan in his punishment of despair. They become food for the flames in the black whirlpool below, becoming eternal members of the church despairing or the church malignant. The church malignant. In the Exodus story, this is typified, it's prefigured by those who remain in Pharaoh's land and by those who even after baptism in the Red Sea refuse to exercise Egypt from their hearts. Now, what's this place like? Hmm. As we mentioned last time, last night, St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite, mystic and doctor of the church, was granted a special visit to hell. She went down there in this life so she wouldn't go there in the next life. Might not be so bad to do that. When she described what she experienced, these are her words. What I felt, it seemed to me, cannot even begin to be exaggerated, nor can it be understood. I experienced a fire in the soul. In the soul that I don't know how I could describe. The bodily pains were so unbearable that though I had suffered excruciating ones in this life, and according to what the doctors say, the worst that can be suffered on earth, for all my nerves were shrunken when I was paralyzed, plus many other sufferings of many kinds that I endured, and even some, as I said, caused by the devil. She says, oh, these were nothing in comparison with the ones I experienced there. I saw furthermore that they would go on without end and without ever ceasing. This, however, once again, she says, was nothing. The physical pains she felt in hell cannot be described, but these were nothing next to the soul's agonizing, a constriction, a suffocation, an affliction so keenly felt with such a despairing and tormenting unhappiness that I don't know how to word it strongly enough. To say the experience is as though the soul were continually being rested from the body would be insufficient. For it would make you think that somebody else was taking away the life. Whereas, here it is the soul itself that tears itself to pieces. 
Wow. Souls in hell are tearing themselves to pieces. Think about that. The church malignant. The fact is that I don't know how to give it a sufficiently powerful description of that interior fire and that despair coming in addition to such extreme torments and pains. It seems to me I felt myself burning and crumbling and I repeat, the worst was that interior fire and despair. Last night we heard of Sister Lucia's vision of hell provided by Our Lady herself on July 13, 1917 at Fatima. In this vision, human souls had fire coming from within them. They were being consumed from the inside out. And yet they were tortured from without, floating around on a sea of flames and being harassed by demons. This description covers the two pains of hell as being those of the soul and those of the body or of the senses. Now, why must it be this way? Now, listen to the ancient desert father, Abba Serenus. He says, sin is never committed from the outside in. He made me do it. It's not like that. Although it may look that way. He says, it's committed from the inside out. That's right. So, just as sin starts on the inside, the worst pains of hell come from the inside. And this is the pain of conscience and remorse of how the damned have, through sin, definitively turned their back on God, the eternal good, and forever separated from Him. This is the worm that dieth not. This is what our Lord called the wailing and grinding of teeth. It is despair. And the soul is tearing itself to pieces in despair. The other pains inflicted, such as being tossed to and fro on the fire and continuous attacks of the demons as seen by Sister Lucia, these are just outward punishments due to the various evils committed. Committed, as it were, on the outside. Oh, then, my people, what a disaster. What a disaster is the loss of a single soul to such a fate. St. Teresa said she would not... Wish it on her very worst enemy. Hell is so terrible. Let us be completely convinced that all the bleeding, dying, and despair of a thousand wars cannot equal the disaster of a single soul being damned to hell. On the other hand, thank God, God provides another end that is completely opposite to this ultimate calamity. And this other end is the church triumphant. Church malignant, church triumphant. So awesome is this place that after seeing something of its wonders, and not all by any means, St. Teresa of Jesus, the same mystical doctor, she writes, I wouldn't want to lose through my own fault as much as one tiny particle of greater glory. So I say that if I were to be asked which I prefer to bear, either to bear all the trials of the world until its end, and that includes our own time, and afterward ascend to a little more glory or without any trials to descend to a little less, I would very eagerly choose all the trials until the end of the world for one degree additional glory in heaven. So wonderful is that one degree. Wow. That's pretty powerful. What is she saying? All the trials of the desert will be worth the effort. The scriptures say, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and the death shall be no more, nor mourning, nor crying, nor sorrow shall be any more for the former things have passed away. Everything will be provided in the promised land of heaven. This is why St. Paul says with great assurance, deep faith, 
No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. In seeing visions of the church, the 19th century Carmelite mystic Blessed Francis Palau exclaims, I saw her beauty, always young, always virgin, all perfection, without stain or wrinkle, infinitely lovable. She is always new. The more one looks, the more one desires to contemplate her. You'll never get tired of looking at her. You'll never get bored in heaven. And her beauty is so great that the more one looks, the more glory one sees. Her beauty is infinite. Don't you want to be a part of that? These two final destinies, these two locations show us that in the end, we will all, we will all be members of either the church triumphant or the devil's church malignant. There is nothing in between. Infinite beauty and loveliness versus infinite pain and despair. There are no other options. And sadly, this hurts, but it's true. Most of mankind, alas, woe, is living in the assembly that despairs down below. Hell is a very popular destiny for man. Did not our Lord say as much? Enter ye at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there are that find it. How narrow is the gate, and straight is the way that leadeth to life, and few there are who find it. in order to avoid hell, that most common and most tragic, horrible, ghastly end of man, we need to spend some time understanding the differences between these two assemblies here on earth. We've talked about them at their end points. What about when they meet here on earth for battle? In order to avoid the one and join the other and remain in her, infinite beauty and loveliness unto eternity. Which of these will be our eternal home? Where will we be numbered? Are we going to be among the sheep or among the goats? You want a good meditation? Kneel down before the Lord and put yourself in the choir of the goats and say, how did I get here? Start thinking about your life in those terms and you won't go there. G.K. Chesterton rightly noted that the Holy Catholic Church prevents us from becoming children of our times. She prevents us from joining the synagogue of Satan. The Holy Catholic Church is the house of God, the gate of heaven. She is supported by four pillars the Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Sacraments, and the Our Father. So the four pillars of the church. With these, we have all we need to come out of Egypt and exercise it completely from our hearts. And these pillars are hers and hers alone. They belong to her. They're ours, even though various people and groups throughout history have stolen some of them in the past and are still making use of them at this current time, causing much confusion. Nevertheless, they belong to the Catholic Church and they're using stolen goods. God's not pleased by that. These are His, these are hers. Now, before we consider these four pillars and how the devil apes them in his assembly, let us reflect a moment on the contrast between the two churches as they are set before us at this time. Now, we stand before you as missionaries of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. In a way, we strive to do for the new Israel, the Catholic Church, what saintly Moses did for the people of Israel of old. 
By the calling of the grace of God, we, her missionaries, standing before you, climb God's holy mountain in prayer and study. We beg intercession from the burning bush, and our la- who is Our Lady. We pray and we meditate. Then we come before you. Come down. And we enter into the world. What has become the Egypt of old? Resuscitated and empowered anew. We're fighting a major battle today. A new Egypt. We speak plainly and truthfully in a way that all can grasp. We try. Praying and hoping that the hearts will be touched by God's grace. Enabling us to break the hold of Pharaoh on God's chosen people. Especially through the exorcism of confession. Repeated if necessary. We record our talks. Hmm? Make them freely available. I'm not going to charge anything for them. So that godly minds and hearts will be refreshed and touched anew by God's truth and grace. We sing a few songs and we pray devotional prayers. The souls that respond come away seeking to do God's holy will by fulfilling their baptismal vows and their duties of their state in life making their way step by step through the desert to the promised land of heaven, where hopefully we will all be happily reunited someday. I hope we're all there together. That's why I'm here tonight. But on the other hand, the devil has his missionaries too. They go around in many different bands, gathering huge crowds in concert halls and stadiums. They preach many messages in a passionate manner through live music and entertainment. Nearly all who attend respond with great enthusiasm, passionately crying out their professions and waving their arms and moving their bodies and doing even more unspeakable things. The message of these missionaries is inevitably to affirm the use of drugs, free love, rebellion from authority and self-discipline in order to act on impulse. I'll do what I want. Do what thou wilt. Shall be the whole of the law. Isn't that what the devil's dark doctor, Alistair Crowley, promoted? These bands are very effective. Their records are, and their, their rec- they record their talks. They record their stuff and make millions and millions, even billions on the sale. Their message has gone out through all the world and it's played over and over again in nearly every place. You can't get away from it. Airports, shopping centers, sporting events, grocery stores. They have names like the Beatles, ACDC, KISS, and other more benign names like Journey, America, the Birds. Timothy Leary, a sort of high priest of LSD, once stated that the Beatles were the four evangelists of the psychedelic movement. It's blasphemy comparing them to the evangelists. In another place, he said, the Catholic Church had her apostles and we've got ours, referring to the rock and roll bands like the Beatles. There's a battle going on here. Are you awake? Do you realize you're being evangelized through this junk coming through these speakers, iPods, home stereo systems, Holy Catholic Church is one. The Holy Catholic Church is one. She is the only self-sufficient and perfect society that provides everything that is needed to be completely happy. She's a perfect society. Now, the devil's assembly can never be perfect. But I'll tell you something. In a sense, it's one. He strives for that oneness too. Steve Jobs, perhaps unwittingly, 
described the devil's worldwide assembly when he said, I think different religions are like different doors to the same house. Sometimes I think the house exists and sometimes I don't. It is a great mystery. That describes it well. The devil's one house has many doors. Many ways of entering, but all of them are doubtful and erroneous in some way. So you end up going, I don't know. In other words, he provides whatever door is wanted. Do without will shall be the whole of the law. If we could read the names on the doors, yes, we would find things like Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, New Age, Wicca, Mormonism, Communism, Scientology, Evolution, Psychology, Science, or make up your own religion. Even you'll find Lutheranism, Calvinism, and so on and on. Whatever we want as long as we do not follow Moses out of Egypt into that desert. Don't follow Moses through that Red Sea into the desert. A Jewish convert to the Holy Church put it this way. I prayed to know his name. I know to know what religion to follow, to serve and worship him properly. I remember praying, let me know your name. I don't mind if you're a Buddha and I have to become a Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan. I don't mind if you're Krishna and I have to become a Hindu. As long as you are not Christ and I have to become a Christian. He understood there's this house with all these doors and there's another one over there that's different. Remember the devil's revelation to Crowley once again. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. The devil is a strong promoter of unity and diversity. He will provide any door we want as long as we enter his one church of surrender and conciliation here on earth so that we will be possessed by him in the one assembly of despairing down below. That's a fact. In the Exodus story, this is symbolized by two things. First, the Egyptians had a panorama of gods. Anything you wanted, they would provide it. They had a god for everything, every natural disposition of man. Now, they had many doors to cover man's moods and desires. Okay? Second, this is very important. It symbolizes the Pharaoh trying to work out some compromise solution for Moses and the Israelites. Pharaoh offered a number of compromise solutions that would allow the Israelites the freedom to worship as they desired as long as they stayed in Egypt. If you remember the story of Exodus, he was trying to work some, some agreement out with Moses. Just stay, Moses. You can do that. In other words, he was trying to make a new door to satisfy Moses. Moses, however, made it plain to him, they must leave Egypt behind. It was the wrong building. They must pass through the Red Sea and the desert beyond, and they must enter God's building. Later in the desert, Moses had to strike the rock with the wood rod to bring forth water for the people. This symbolized the piercing of the side of Christ on the wood of the cross by the soldier, Longinus. Now somewhat later, when the people were in need of water again, as we heard in the reading tonight, Moses was told now to speak to the rock. Not to strike it. Because he'd already struck it once. He was supposed to speak to the rock in order to bring out the water. But he struck it. He struck it once, nothing happened. He struck it again, water came out. For this he was punished. He was not allowed to enter the promised land. Why? His striking the rock again symbolized that there was more than one Christ. And that was wrong. More than one building. And he was punished for that. He did not show forth the sanctity of God. In opposition to the devil's one building with many doors stands the church, the one true church 
There's only one door for all to enter. St. Paul is plain. There's only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The church teaches, listen to this very carefully, in explicit terms, Christ himself affirmed the necessity of faith and baptism and thereby affirmed also the necessity of the church. For through baptism, as through a door, men enter the church. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. This is it. There's only two. No in between. There's only one door to the Catholic Church. This other church has all kinds of doors. And the devil is like the wind. He can get through the tiniest cracks. He makes the most amazing doors available to people. Oh, how fortunate we are to be Catholic. And this is plainly seen by reflecting on the four pillars of the church, the creed, the sacraments, the commandments, and the Our Father. Let's go through them. The creed. Do you really understand what you have in the creed? The beauty of the creed. Thanks to the creed, we know what is true and false with the greatest certainty. No doubting like Steve Jobs. The Holy Catholic Church alone is gifted with infallibility in order to teach and define and resolve all questions pertaining to faith and morals. We have 20 centuries of her infallible teaching to guide us and protect us from all error. Thus, she has shown us at time and time again what is true and what is false. What is of God and what is of the world, fallen man, and the father of lies. Only she can help us understand that wind of the devil that can get through the tiniest cracks. Thanks to the church, we can say with great assurance and safety, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Oh, how many people, my dear people, do you realize how many people today are without any real beliefs? They're confused, they're anxious, they're depressed. They change their beliefs from day to day to suit their mood or their situation or what they've recently read or heard on the news. And if they do believe in something, it is without any solid foundation, for Christ is the only rock on which we can safely build. As St. Paul exclaims, Jesus Christ yesterday and today and the same forever. He doesn't change. Be not led away by various and strange doctrines. Thank you, St. Paul. Outside of Christ, all is shifting and unstable. Without Christ, man can only believe in what amounts to be sand. Blind forces, evolution, or everything is relative. Boy, that makes peace of soul. You like going to bed at night, everything's relative, doesn't matter. People aren't happy. Oh, we're just some speck of dust in the universe and we're of no account. We don't mean anything to anybody. They have no father. They have no father. They can't say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. They have no purpose in life. They're most to be pitied. But we need to beware. In the dream St. John Bosco had of the church of our times, he saw a big ship being barraged with countless books and pamphlets filled with errors. Since Egypt and all her errors have filled the world around us, we need to study. We need to know our faith. Know your faith. Know what the creed means. Now, Satan is going to mock this pillar of the church. Satan is going to provide his own teaching and his own doctrines. He has his own magisterium. 
He has the media. He has various doctors, experts, lettered university professors. He has psychologists and occultists. And they're perpetually conducting studies, tests, polls, seances in order to tell us what to believe and not to believe. And these things change from year to year. These studies inevitably lend their support to the spirit of the age and produce the results that are conciliatory to modern man. Surrender is the watchword. For example, the sodomites want to believe that man is born that way. Can't help it. That's the way he was made. And so off science goes to prove it. Remember that pithy saying of Chesterton? What do you say? The church prevents us from becoming children of our times. Don't give in to these modern nonsense studies. We listen to the church. She knows how to prevent that wind of Satan from getting into the tiniest cracks. Are we listening to her? Do we study her ancient teachings and those of her saints? I hope you do. One of Pharaoh's doctors of the occult, a missionary, nay, even a sort of spouse, a wife of Satan, is Madame Helena Blavatsky. She died in the year 1891. In a sense, she is the devil's Teresa of Jesus. She herself often visited the land of Ham. Why? She tells us she went there seeking ways to liberate the human mind. Sound familiar? What did Crowley learn in Egypt? Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Be free. Free your mind from all this oppression of the church and her teachings. That's the devil. Here are two of Madame Blavatsky's primary objectives in life. Number one, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, underline that word, creed, doesn't matter what you believe, sex, caste, or color. This is nothing else than Satan's one house with the many doors. You can believe whatever you want. I just want you united. Second of all, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science. Comparative religion. All these doors, check them out. She held that this tr- that truth is the substratum and basis of all the world religions and philosophies. Does this sound familiar? There's lots of people going around and say, oh, all these religions have truth in them and they're good. When asked... Well, by the way, what does St. Paul say about that? All the gods of the nations are devils. Scripture, inspired by God, tells us they're all demons. Don't mess with that stuff. When asked, she was asked, is there such a thing as absolute truth in the hands of any one party or man? In other words, does the church, does the Roman Catholic Church have a corner on the truth? What she was being asked, she answers, there cannot be. There's no room for absolute truth upon any subject whatsoever. But there are relative truths, and we have to make the best that we can of these relative truths. This lie is the basis for the devil's house with all the doors. This kind of thinking is everywhere today, causing many people to hit their heads against the wall, trying to figure out how things work, going down this path and then down that one, opening this door, and, well, that's not the right one, trying another one. They're all dead ends. It makes it easy after a while just to give up, to turn off the mind, to listen to the devil's missionary preachers, their bands, and live a carnal life. The Holy Catholic Church has the absolute and unchanging truth himself as our king, our head, and our master. We have the whole truth without error. We have him revealed to us in his fullness, even in the flesh. We have him here tonight in the Blessed Sacrament. 
We have the doctors and the fathers and the saints to guide us. Are we thankful? Thank you, God. Thank you. Being thankful for this does something. It opens us up for a deeper love and knowledge of the faith. It enables us to grow in His grace. Love the faith. Love your faith. Be thankful for the creed. What a gift it is. Now, after the creed, the Holy Church has the seven fonts of life that spring ever anew. These are the sacraments, our source of supernatural life. Grace is like spiritual gasoline for our spiritual engines, spiritual organisms, with the sacraments being the spiritual gas station and the church as the refinery. Moses had the Red Sea, preceded by the exorcism of plagues. We have the baptism. We have baptism, traditionally preceded by a number of little exorcisms. In the desert, they had the manna that came from heaven and the water from the rock. We have the most blessed sacrament, Christ himself in his fullness, body, blood, soul, and divinity, springing forth from the rock of the altar when the priest speaks to the rock. Out comes the manna and the blood. He speaks the sacred words of consecration over bread and wine. In the desert, they made confession of their sins before the bronze serpent and were saved from death. Through the priest that consecrates at the altar, he has the blood in his hands. He can now absolve your sins in confession. And they're gone. As far as the east is from the west. Oh, what wonders we have in the church. Are we thankful? Do we treat these fonts of life with reverence and use them devoutly? The more devoutly we receive them, the more the graces flow. The more thankful we are for them, the more we open ourselves to His grace. Love the sacraments. Yet beware. The devil has his sacraments too. And they are often used more frequently than ours. Some examples. His followers seek consolation in their own manna. Drugs. That's the devil's manna. Some thousands of years ago, native Indians in South America, they discovered the hallucinatory mushrooms and they called it God's flesh. Modern occultists were not slow in picking up on the spiritual significance. They wrote, one wrote, it permits you to see more clearly than our perishing eye can see. Vistas beyond the horizons of this life to travel backwards and forwards in time. They were seeing things, in other words. To enter other planes of existence, even to know God. According to the Indian tradition and rituals, among other things, these mushrooms must be picked by virgins before dawn at the time of the new moon. This is a mockery of the Holy Mass. For in the Mass, we have a time portal. We are transported through faith to Calvary. We're transported into heaven. We see God elevated. The Mass is a timelessness to it. This is the mystery of our faith. The church prefers celibate men to offer the Mass. And that cloistered nuns, virgins, make the hosts. See how the devil mocks our Lord and his church? He seems to be saying, well, you've got your manna and I've got mine. For the more dedicated followers of the devil, he provides the various black masses, which are a mockery of the Holy Mass itself. Satan wants to be worshipped like God. How is God worshipped? At our altar. He wants his own altar. How do we worship God in the Mass? He wants his own Mass. By saying these black masses, the Satanists confirm themselves in sin. They offend God deeply, thereby gaining great power and favors from the devil. 
Listen to one of the rubrics for a black mass. Brace yourself, okay? The host is generally stolen from a Catholic church. It's dyed black. We have white hosts, they have black hosts. And cut it into a triangular shape. They love triangles. The blood is generally from a previously sacrificed animal or bird, although for a major high Sabbath. This is horrible. The most effective sacrifice is an unbaptized baby. Rubric from the Black Mass. They know that to find the Eucharist, they need to go to the Catholic Church or to someone who has stolen the Mass from them, such as some Orthodox or schismatic group with valid orders. Furthermore, as we heard, they want unbaptized babies for their Black Sabbath. Why? Why do they want unbaptized babies? Because they know that baptized babies go straight to heaven. Clearly, there is often much more going on in abortion clinic than just a crisis pregnancy. Many reports have filed in as to how the abortion is being used as a sort of diabolical sacrament in some of these clinics. The devil has other sacraments, something for every door. Jim Jones, remember Jim Jones? Jonestown, Guyana. He used Kool-Aid spiked with poison to help usher nearly a thousand souls into the church malignant, commit suicide. And those who didn't want to commit it, he made them commit it. The various 12-step programs which have occult roots, each has a form of confession. Hi, I'm Al and I'm an alcoholic. And they go on to tell their sins without ever receiving absolution. To me, as a priest, that is offensive. They don't get absolution. This is a trick of the devil. They are fooled into identifying themselves with their sin. I'm an alcoholic. And they identify themselves. They define themselves by their sin. That's not right. This is one of those doors. That's not of God. When one surrenders to his assembly, temptations are removed. Things work out. Good jobs suddenly appear. Success follows, at least for a while. The way becomes easy and paved, wide and well-traveled. Sound familiar? If you do what the devil wants, he'll help you overcome that addiction at least for a while. He won't bother you anymore. He won't tempt you. It may seem like it works, but it won't work unto heaven. Let us take the desert path. Yes, it is narrow. Yes, it is hard. But it is the right path. And it has spiritual gas stations all along the way, making our progress and successful passage possible. Then now let's go to the third pillar. The third pillar is the commandments and all that the moral teaching of the church that flows from them. The commandments are the instruction sheet of how we and the world around us are made. So many are hurting themselves today, trying to figure out what they should do and what they shouldn't do. What should be done and what should be avoided. They don't know. So they experiment and they hurt themselves more and more deeply as they go along how hard it is for them to find right, the right path. Oh, what a grace it is to be Catholic, to know right from wrong. Do you realize what you have? Are we thankful? Being thankful opens us up for grace to live a more virtuous and upright life. 
Not surprisingly, the devil has his commandments too. Once again, the 12-step program is filled with all kinds of commandments. And a lot of these commandments don't match up with what you find in the Catholic Church. Many occultists have become avid environmentalists. Charles Manson was a very serious environmentalist. And he had commands for all his people. Don't you dare do this and don't you do that or I'll kill you. And he went so far as to say, don't step on a scorpion or a spider or a snake. There's all kinds of commands out there. Scientists today are commanded to find evolution as the reason for all things if they hope to keep their jobs or get a grant. The communists are commanded to be fomenting revolution perpetually in order to bring about change. Listen to Saul Alinsky who dedicated his book to Satan who rebelled and got his own kingdom. The church malignant. Here's what he said. The first step in community organization is community disorganization. The organizer dedicated to changing the life of a particular community must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community, fan into latent hostilities of many of the people into the point of overt expression. Get them to hate each other, in other words. He must search out controversy. People are not concerned enough to act. They must feel so frustrated, so defeated, so lost, so futureless in the prevailing system that they will be willing to let go of the past and chance the future. Hope for a future. A revolutionary organizer must shake up the prevailing patterns of the people's lives, agitate, create disenchantment and discontent with the current values to produce a passion for change. That's what a communist has to do. Foment trouble. Cause people to get at each other. Don't ever do that. It's easy to do. Pit your family members against each other. It's communism. The devil also wants his followers to be completely liberated. So he gives them some commands in regards to carnal sins. Be free. Free love is his command. He wants them to have sexual license. This is simply because the more one sins, especially with sins of lust, the more blind one becomes to what is right and wrong. In a word, the more one gives way to lust, the easier it is for the devil to possess him forever. It is not without reason Our Lady of Fatima said, the more souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than for any other reason. Oh, how wonderful is the church. She alone keeps us from becoming children of our times. She keeps us on the right path to purity of life. Are we listening to her? Do we love her? Finally, the church teaches how to converse with God. And this one is very important for our times. This one may sting a little. It's important. We pray as he taught us, our Father... We chant the psalms. We use the words of his angels and saints. Hail Mary, full of grace. What a gift this is. We do not have to worry about offering a prayer that is displeasing to God, but only what causes him pleasure. We know what he likes. Isn't that nice? Isn't it nice to know what someone likes and you do it for them and they're happy? We know what God likes. He told us. He gave us all these prayers. I like these prayers. That's what he's saying. He's indulged these prayers. I'll help you if you say them. Holy Rosary, Stations of the Cross, Adoration, prayerfully reading the sacred scriptures. In a word, God provides us with the spirituality that is safe and pleasing to him. And this spirituality is found only in the church, the body of Christ. This spirituality is a participation in the spirituality of the church herself, of the life of the church, of the soul of the church. 
Who's the soul of the church? The Holy Ghost. Listen to St. Augustine. To receive the Spirit of Christ, we must go to the body of Christ. To receive the Spirit of Christ, we must go to the body of Christ. Burn it on your heart. Burn it in your mind. To receive the Spirit of Christ, we must go to the body of Christ. What is the Spirit of Christ? The Holy Ghost. That's the soul of the church. The very body of Christ. The meaning of this simple statement is very profound. St. Augustine is pointing out that the good Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, is embodied. It's embodied. What does that mean? When I want to speak to you, I would find out where your body is. Then I can talk to your soul and your spirit. Okay? That's how I find you. I go where your body is located and there you are. Even after a person has died, where do we normally go to speak to them? We go to the grave where they're buried. We want to speak to a saint. We go to their tomb where their body is or their relics are or at least where their statue is, a representation of their body. And we pray. This is how God made us. This is how he wants us to seek his Holy Ghost as well. This is how he wants us to seek him. Now, St. Augustine is teaching us that the Holy Ghost is not a disembodied spirit, but an embodied spirit in the church. Thus, he says in another place, one possesses the Holy Ghost to the extent that he loves the church of Christ. Let me repeat that. One possesses the Holy Ghost to the extent he loves the church of Christ. What are some of the examples of disembodied spirits? Demons are disembodied spirits. Human ghosts in hell, the damned, they're disembodied spirits. Poltergeists are disembodied spirits. They belong to no body that is unified by an organizing soul or spirit as is the body of Christ, the church. We're alive. They're dead. The point we're making here is essential to understanding the incredible, the incredible peril that man is in today. Most people, sad to say, many inside the church herself are searching for a spirituality. A spirituality that is not of the church. This is where it starts to sting for some. That's not of God. And what is sobering and frightening, especially to me as a priest, when you think about this, they'll find one. The devil will provide them one, a spirituality. Many are using spiritualities today that are from below, not from above. Once again, the devil is like a wind. He can get through the tiniest cracks. Let's take in a couple of examples. Yoga is an example. Listen to a definition of yoga. Yoga is the Hindu practice of physical, mental, and spiritual discipline originating in ancient India. The goal of yoga, let's stop right there. Originating where? In ancient India? You mean it's not hooked to the Our Father? It, it, it's not approved by the church? It's not indulged? It's not from the church. The goal of yoga or of the person practicing yoga is the attainment of a state of perfect spiritual insight. I will give you visions. I will enlighten you. You will feel at peace. And you will find tranquility meditating on the Hindu concept of divinity or Brahman. You don't have to meditate on that. You can meditate on whatever you want. Just do the yoga. 
And I'll make sure you have some peace. That's not from God. Does this not ape the true spirituality of the church, which addresses the needs of man on all levels? Don't forget that Crowley found some of the positions of yoga incredibly powerful. They call upon spirits. Just a bodily position alone is important. It's a signal to the devil. Other examples. Enneagram, that's from Sufi Islam. Reiki, very dangerous. Many exorcisms are going on across this country because of Reiki. You're being cursed through Reiki. You don't know. Zen Buddhism, centering prayer. That's not Catholic. Twelve-step programs have a whole spirituality involved with them. Not Catholic. Didn't come from inside the church. New Agers pride themselves in making up their own personalized spiritualities. One that will suit them the most. Make me the most happy in my way of life. I can pick and choose where I like. What's going on here? Why is this happening? Let's be clear. These folks are looking for a spirituality that is divorced from Christ and His church. And I'll tell you what they're really doing. They don't want to go to Calvary. They don't want this. They're trying to get away from it because this is where the true spirituality is. What did Jesus say? When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all things to myself. What did St. Paul say? You want to go to heaven? You want to rise with Christ? You need to die with him. I want that kind, kind, comfortable religion. Okay, I'll give you a door for that. To separate them, that is Christ, the spirituality of Christ and his church, to divorce them, just to have a spirituality apart from the church, is the same as seeking a disembodied spirit. And once again, whoever does this will find one. They will receive experiences that are seem heavenly, consoling visions, locutions, spiritual touches. They will receive what feels like the working of grace, but this is all the working of the devil. Suffice it to say that experienced mystical doctors of the, of the life, of the spiritual life, like St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Jesus, the author of the medieval work, The Cloud of Unknowing, they teach us that the devil can and does, he does provide spiritual experiences. That the devil has contemplatives. The devil has contemplatives. Yikes. In other words, he can simulate the real thing very easily, at least on the level of the body to the satisfaction of most people in modern Egypt. At least in the short term, even saints have fallen for this at times, good ones too. The devil, a disembodied spirit, can satisfy man's itch for a spiritual life. This is nothing else but the Pharaoh offering his compromised solution to Moses. There are many doors in the devil's assembly and he will make one just for you. He's pretty good at that. Once again, in truth, there are only two churches in which each of their members are possessed forever. Those in the Holy Catholic Church are possessed by the very soul of the church, the Holy Ghost. They are embodied having all their needs provided, those outside the Catholic Church are disembodied. They're dangerous and ultimately are possessed by the devil, having no needs satisfied except one, to pay the debt due to their sins for all eternity. Dear faithful of Christ, dearly beloved, let us be completely convinced that the Holy Roman Catholic Church is the only perfect society and is perfectly supported by these four pillars. She is lacking in nothing. There's no reason for us at all to be looking outside of her for anything. We have everything we need inside. Let us then shun 
and despise every attempt of the devil to make us go back to Egypt and let us reject his suggestions to make any compromise solution. Let us end tonight with these profound words of Blessed Francis Palau. Seeing the church in a vision, the beautiful church he saw as a virgin, and he cried out these beautiful words, Virgin most pure, open your heart and receive into your arms the son of Adam who cannot live apart from you. Holy Church, receive into your heart this lover who longs to see you face to face without veils. Congregation of all my neighbors, united in Christ your head, virgin ever beautiful, your presence is sufficient for me. I am happy with you. I desire for nothing. With you I have everything. Oh, how beautiful you are. I adore thee. I surrender to thee. I consecrate my love to thee. And if ever in my life I have not acted towards thee as thou deservest, receive now the offering of my heart, which adores thee. And the church spoke back to him and said, The more you look at me, and the more you will love me, the more you look at me, the more you will love me. And the more you love me, the more pure and chaste you will be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.